Hi, Esther. Hi, Nana. Can you believe we're here? Finally, we're here. Finally. You know, the irony was that I first saw you um, set under your, um, you were on a panel years ago, Columbia. Um, oh, wow. Years ago, I was studying at Mailman and I went to a program at SEPA. Right. And I was actually there to meet somebody who was on your panel. And then I met you and I was like, she has really great thoughts. And then like, <laughs> many years, it could have been, it was many, many years later after that, we met again in Ghana. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I think that panel at Columbia was, what, 2011, 2000? Yeah, just before I left New York and moved to Ghana. Moved to Ghana, right. Wow. And then here we are sitting on the couch to talk about the work that you've been doing. Yeah, that's a full circle moment. Full circle moment. It really is. It really is very full circle for me and for you as well. So it I wanted is. to say thank you. Thank you. So your book, Emotional Justice, recently came out. By recently, I mean the last couple of years. Um, and... We will get into it because there's so many nuggets in there. But I also want to first give those who are listening and watching, as long as as well as myself, a sense of um, so little Esther. So what is the the story, the line between little Esther, mm. who was born in post independence Ghana, all the way to Big Esther, who is doing this incredible work right. um, with the AMA Institute of Emotional Justice and so on and so forth. So I am a, a child shaped by silence. Oh, wow. Um, I remember as a kid in my home that my, we would all eat, sit around the kitchen, in the kitchen, sit around the table and eat. And my parents would talk, but we wouldn't. And we were not allowed to. And they were talking in, in Shui. Mm -hmm. And we were not allowed to. And it made me both a listener and an observer and a creator of worlds, which I think is what you do when there's a lot of silence around you. You create worlds because you're not participating in the one that is around you. Um, I am a child shaped by silence. And that is such a, it's such a powerful entry point that leads me to be the kind of journalist that I became, which is, I'm able to really listen for the space between the question that I ask and the answer that somebody gives me in order to ascertain the truth that they don't want to say, but that I'm trying to hear. Mm. And what I learn is that it's in the pause between a question and an answer that the world that you're really trying to access lives as a journalist but I learned that because I was a kid shaped by silence. Right. Um, I was a kid shaped by silence who loved languages. So was curious about cultures other than my own and was really interested in speaking French and speaking Spanish and ended up speaking both and then traveling. And I think the power of being shaped by silence is it makes you really attuned to environment. Mm -hmm. You really watch and you watch differently um, because solitude becomes your friend mm -hmm. and silence doesn't scare you. You don't feel like you have to fill it up. You know, when people are speaking and there's a lull in a conversation and you feel like people have to fill up the sun. I was never that person because I was raised in the quiet mm -hmm. and there is all silence is not peaceful. And I learned about the different kinds of silence that operate and move in our worlds and in our spaces. And I learned them young. I just didn't have language for what I experienced, but I developed it as I got older. Okay. So in the timeline of events in your life, can mm -hmm. you walk me through that? Because we're going to talk about the timeline mm -hmm. of your emotional justice work as well. Mm -hmm. But I want to get a sense of, okay, um, late 60s, your family left Ghana mm -hmm. in the wake of a coup, mm -hmm. which brought you to the, the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, you live, you grew up there, lived and worked there until you moved to New York City mm -hmm. and then finally Ghana. Mm -hmm. And so if I was like a tiny little fly that was like following you around, what would I be seeing in your life during your upbringing between leaving Ghana and circling back to Ghana? Um, 
A lot of motion. You know, there's this wonderful phrase that not all who wander are lost. Yeah. Um, I was a wanderer and uh, uh, a seeker of community that understood my particular weirdness. Um, and so I was somebody who, um, out of school, uh, uh, late teens, I decided I'm just going to go to Madrid. Um, I'm going to go travel, check it out, speak Spanish for a month, and then um, come back. Because then living in, in London and the UK, there's Eurostar. It's literally cost the price of a subway ticket to get to another European country. So it was very easy to travel. I wish that we would understand that in, in, on the continent yeah. so that we could do the same thing and have people explore yeah. our continent more easily. Um, so I was an explorer. And, but I think I was also a, I was seeking safety because w where I was didn't always feel safe. Mm -hmm. I didn't have language for the unsafety, but I had the feeling of it. So I was looking for places and ways and cultures that would make me feel safer. I'd have to learn what that was, but at the time I'm in, I'm, I'm in seeking mode. So I'm in Madrid, then I come back. Um, I am not yet doing journalism, so I'm um, temping and working in different spaces and places. And then I decide I'm gonna move to Las Islas Canarias, the Canary Islands. And I moved there and I lived there for almost two years. Um, and there I really discovered that I'm a storyteller. Um, come back, study journalism. Um, and then I'm a journalist who ends up traveling within my journalism. So I was, I'm based in London, but I end up traveling to um, Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, Lesotho, uh, Washington. And it is in those travels that this work that would become emotional justice starts to emerge. Um, but I was always... I was always being adopted within communities and families. Um, I traveled a lot on my own when I was in my teens and my early 20s. And it was always interesting to me that I was always claimed by different communities and spaces. So when I worked in, in um, the Canary Islands, I worked with this man. It was hilarious. It was, um, I was like a tour guide, like a holiday tour guide. So this is, I wasn't doing journalism or anything like that. And he hated English people and was in a, his hotel catered to English people. Right. So he actually reminded me of an African elder, an ornery, cantankerous, wonderful African elder who had created this industry that made him a lot of money and his family a lot of money, but he didn't like the people that he was catering to at all. So he could never, no holiday guides who were recruited from the UK ever stayed. And I remember when I met him, two things became clear. One is that he's an elder. He hates the casual familiarity that English people use towards elders. So they don't necessarily say, sir, and they don't greet him in his own language. I spoke fluent Spanish. I never spoke to him in English and I always called him sir. Mm -hmm. And he loved me and I felt like I'd been adopted into his family. I met him, all his family, the grandchildren, and there's Ibiza, which is very touristy, but then there's old Ibiza, which is frankly just very wealthy. And um, I spent a lot of time out there and with his whole community of, of folks and was weirdly part of a family. And that was my experience many times when I traveled. Yeah. I would meet people and I would be claimed and brought into space and taken care of in a particular way. And I think that was a manifestation of an emotional longing and a need for a healing that I didn't have language for yet. Um, I was navigating internal traumas. I was you know, getting educated and going to school getting into university. I didn't go, but I get getting into university so that I can identify I'm that smart kid. I can do that. Um, but I was really internally traumatized oh. and didn't really have language for that. So I was just keep moving, keep one foot in front of the other, keep going. Um, but you know, what I learned is that your professional skill set and qualifications are no bomb and they do not rescue you from the devastation of trauma. You're gonna have to deal with it, face it, engage it at some point. And that's really how I end up doing the work that I do 
facing and dealing with my own personal trauma that is also my family trauma that I then connect to the country that I am part of Ghana and then because of the work that I do as a journalist and I'm a radio journalist I'm a print journalist who becomes a radio journalist becomes an investigative news reporter a documentary maker a tv producer I'm both in front of and behind the camera all of that type all of those different types of storytelling become enmeshed to do the work that I would end up doing but it really does start with wrestling with my own internal trauma and knowing that I presented as somebody who seemed to have it very much together that I was smart that I was um eloquent that I um was professional but I was also internally um troubled and knew that I I I would say I remember saying when I was 17 18 I feel damaged and I don't know why and I didn't know why but I constantly felt that what was the beginnings of sort of so how does one move from I feel damaged I'm not really sure what's going on to where we are now where you're doing the work not just on an individual level even like a personal level to a global societal level as well. I mean, we'll get into that deeper, but I'm always curious. I'm always like fascinated by people who are able to sort of take their situation and and somehow say, "Well, something's not right." I'm always curious to know like what is right. the something that's telling you that something is not right? Right. I mean, I think I would be lying if if I said that there was real clarity to it or some aha moment. It just yeah. wasn't true. I just felt damaged. and that was the only language that i had it wasn't there wasn't a clarity to it there wasn't a okay this is where i'm going to go this is what i'm going to do i continued to put one foot in front of the other and be the best journalist i could be and win awards and i masked being damaged with glamour okay so as long as i looked great and looked good people didn't really pay too much attention below the external and i think very much in Ghana we're a culture that says as long as you look good you are good and then if you don't look good you're not good mm-hmm. but it doesn't there's no in between of that you know there's no but what if you look good but actually you're doing terrible yeah. you're actually having a really hard time and i think um we police appearance as a marker of our emotional health and i know that i learned that you know for sure now there is the part of me that genuinely loves glamour and style and that is part of my spirit but i also definitely remember as a young person i've got to look like i have it together cuz then i'll have it together but i i i felt definitely i felt you know damaged um and it really the beginning of um starting to really wrestle and reckon with that was these three assignments the first of which happened in 1997 yeah. when i got to ghana and my mother tells me a story that i didn't know anything about and her breaking her silence as a kid who was shaped by silence is an absolute unleashing of what becomes a tidal wave that then becomes emotional justice but i had you know it's a weird thing to feel damaged but not have language for it because you kind of live in this space of constantly trying to make sure that nobody else thinks you look damaged you're constantly trying to mask and suppress that it's exhausting i'm so glad that i got to the point where i stopped doing it um because it's exhausting and i think we spend a lot of time i think as women as black women we're taught that and that the mask is king. Oh, so taking it back to sort of um coming to Ghana in 1997 and your mm-hmm. mother um obviously 1997 was was an important year in Ghana mm-hmm. history. 40 years year. of independence. 40 years of independence and so you're having conversations of people who lived through that period mm-hmm. obviously. And through that you have this discussion discussion with your mother where she reveals to you and you talk about it in the book as well. But she reveals to you something that basically shed light to um an emotional trauma that you had been reliving in your life as well. Mm-hmm. And then during that same period shortly after that you travel um to South Africa to witness the truth and reconciliation process um on apartheid era crimes. Mm-hmm. You are able to sit down and meet with the great Winnie Madikizela Mandela as well as 
Stephen Biko's um, widow. But in your book, you, Wendy Mandela gives you advice. She says something to you mm -hmm. that I literally like stopped. Like I was reading, I was like, <laughs> like I was, I, I was so emotional. I teared up. I gagged literally when I read that portion of the book. Right. And she essentially asked you that as you go on to learn and because the assignment obviously was to travel around the world and you were seeing um, different injustices, specifically in, in Ghana's case is colonization in South Africa's case is colonization and apartheid. Um, she asked you to center your mother's silence. Mm. Can you tell me what that did for you? Because I know what it did for me in the book. Right. But I can only imagine what that did for you in real life. Right. Can you expound on like what that did for you? Yeah. What that did to you. Yeah. Um, I was in Ghana in 1997 when my mother broke what was almost a 30 year silence and told me the story of the night the tanks came, which is the February 66 coup. Right. I had lived with um, nightmares for almost 20 years and I learned that the nightmares that I was experiencing was the same set of events that my mother described when she broke her silence. Yeah. So what I connected was the things that made me feel damaged had a context, mm -hmm. had a reason, had a reality that I didn't know and I didn't understand. Um, so my mother breaking her silence was just a game changer, it was a world changer for me. When I go to Philadelphia from Ghana, yeah. And I meet Winnie Mandela. She's the keynote speaker at the Million Woman March, yes. which is why I'm there. And I tell her this story. Um, and she says to me, when you go to South Africa, send to your mother's broken silence. There was a second game changer because I felt what she was saying to me is that there are many ways that people reveal the truth of their experiences. Mm -hmm. One of those ways of revelation is not what they share, it's what they don't share. Mm -hmm. And that means you've got to ask different kinds of questions. And it means you've got to pay a different kind of attention. And who you pay attention to has to change. And it was just mind blowing to me because I had my little list, you know, I had my list of people that I was going to speak with and interview. And I had still then had my understanding of journalism was very connected to a strong, sharp, you know, questions and pay attention to what the answer is and what people are saying. And that was a complete 180 for me. Yeah. Because what it taught me was that, no, it's not about the question that you ask and the way the person answers. What happens between after you finish asking the question and before they start speaking? Yeah. And that's where you have to pay attention. And so this centering of my mother's broken silence was just a complete game changer for me and totally transformed how I then both practiced journalism for the rest of the time that I was a journalist, but then went into South Africa. And what Winnie Mandela said is, I know you have that. I had a list of men that I was speaking to and she would look down at the list and looked at me and smiled and said, no women. I didn't even think about it. Yeah. I didn't even think about it. That's how ingrained patriarchy is in all of us. I didn't even think about it. And um, she said, I need you to speak to the men that's very important. But first, I need you to listen to the women. She didn't say speak to the women. I need you to listen to them. And because I had now connected silence with revelation, how I was going to listen was very different. And so that's what I did. And it made me look at, look at and think about Winnie Mandela completely differently. Um, I thought about her emotional intelligence as a black woman outside of warrior status and freedom fighter and, you know, being Winnie Mandela, all the things that we know about her. Mama Winnie. Mama Winnie, all of that. I, I just looked at her differently as a result of that conversation. And it was quiet. We were on a podium. She was getting ready to do a keynote. People were greeting her. I had a chance to stand, stand with her for not that long, but I shared what my mother had shared with me. And uh, she was very emotional when I told her what my mother had said. And then when she said, send to the silence of, um, send to the silence of your mother when you moved through South Africa. And it changed how I moved through South Africa. I realized that 
every time a woman was silent in a space that was all about an outpouring and storytelling, I turned and paid attention to her. And I wondered about what she was not saying. And then sometimes I would ask, what is the thing you would like us to know, but you don't want to share? Um, that's how I came to really understand that the emotional lives of black people and specifically black women are entire worlds that are happening often in silence, often deeply traumatized, very, very complex, but they are a revelation that is a game changer if we would just pay more attention to the silence. That became the work. What does it mean to pay attention to the silence? And what does it then mean to bring the silence to the attention of other people? And hence we get into your work today, mm -hmm. which is emotional justice. And as we talk about the love languages of emotional, emotional justice, emotional justice is a framework whereby we, um, we center not necessarily the politics, mm -hmm. but we center sort of the connections and the emotions, if I'm getting that right. Mm -hmm. Because as a concept, I'm still learning and fully fleshing out um, my wording and my understanding of emotional justice. But from reading your book and from, from looking into um, emotional justice, I, I've been taking it to heart to say, what does this mean for me? Mm, um, love as, that. You know, as a, as a new mother who's raising both a boy and a girl, mm -hmm. as a um, relatively new wife, as someone who's grappling with my past and trying to reconcile the kind of mothering that I want to do. That's why the, the, the quotation about what your mother said what Mama Winnie said to you about centering her silence hit home mm. so strongly because it also made me realize how much so social justice, like big capital SJ social justice, mm -hmm. really begins on an individual or an, on an emotional level. And I had never really looked at it like that. Right. Even though I was having these big emotional reactions to, mm. to, to issues of social justice, right. I had never really looked at it like, oh, we can begin the conversations that sort of center emotional language mm -hmm. um, to drive towards a just future. Mm. That's so powerful. Emotional justice is a racial healing roadmap. Got it. Um, it wrestles with this legacy of untreated trauma right. that has shaped all of us because of the world's that have shaped us and the systems in those worlds. So whether that's colonialism on the continent, enslavement, apartheid, we are all shaped by them. Yeah. And because we are, it develops a sense of ourselves with ourselves and with each other. And when it comes to the world of emotions, we've both gendered it and then disregarded it. Mm -hmm. We make emotions untrustworthy. Mm -hmm. We gender them. We say, well, I said this woman, she's being emotional. Yeah as if that is somehow not a human quality, but is instead something problematic that means you shouldn't be paid attention to. And we have divorced the world of the emotional when it comes to our justice movement, social justice, environmental justice, labor justice, gender justice, even though emotions are such a massive part of how we get here. So what does that mean? It means that there is a, a dehumanization, particularly for global black people when it comes to the fight and the search for justice. We think it's just about the politics, the legislation, the policy, the environment, the labor, the gender. Emotional justice is saying all of those things matter, but the pivotal missing piece is the emotional justice in every single one of them. That we have a generational inheritance that is this untreated trauma that is the result of these harmful systems that have shaped all of us. The question is, we ask both individually and then connected institutionally, how did these oppressive systems show up and how we engage with each other and how we engage ourselves? And specifically, I talk about the language of whiteness. Yeah. The language of whiteness being this narrative that has shaped all of us about how the world came to be, about how Ghana comes to be and the continent comes to be, that teaches all of us that whiteness is the world, saves the world, built the world, rules the world, teaches all of us that white people are the leaders 
anybody who is not white is a learner. So the West is the leader and Africa is the learner. Africa is the problem and the West has the solution. And that teaching, whilst we now intellectually understand is a crock of we all know what, has emotionally shaped an identity to the continent that is rooted in inferiority. It shows up in, for example, we still deal with a level of success that is connected with working outside of the continent, outside of ourselves, having an education outside of the continent, outside of ourselves. We're both products of that. And I- 100%. Right, so, 100%. You know, and, and I've been taught that. Yeah. You know, the idea that I know that as a journalist, because I was a journalist with the BBC for many years, yeah. that was a particular pedigree. Yeah. That was the thing to be respected yeah. by all of us, by me and all the different people that I came across. And so emotional justice is unlearning this narrative that centers whiteness and teaches all of us that whiteness is the center, the aspiration, the goal, the everything. That, and whiteness means aspiring to be as little of yourself as a black or an African person as possible. The less you are yourself, the more successful you are likely to be. How does um, that show uh, up in our lives? Because I think th there's a difference because we like the binaries. This person right. is racist, this person is not racist. Right. This person is self-loathing and this person is not self-loathing. Right. Right. But I find that like these ideals sometimes show up in very granular ways. Like I recently yeah. locked my hair, for instance, right? right. And before I talked many years about locking my hair and for many years, I mean, I mean, a few days before I locked it, a friend of mine asked me, what's keeping you back? What's holding you back from locking your hair? And now I have to grapple with this idea of neutrality, mm -hmm. mimicking some proximity, some imagined proximity to whiteness or um, I had to grapple with this idea. Well, I don't want to. And this is hard coming from me as someone who's proudly African mm -hmm. to say, do I grapple somewhere deep inside of me with the fear of leaning too much into my blackness? Is there a consequence that I fear mm -hmm. of what might happen to me or to my children if I lean too much mm. into my blackness? Mm. And, and that's done on me right. that I may be grappling with certain right. aspects of that. Right. And that's a very, that is an offshoot of what it means to be shaped by the language of whiteness. Yeah. Because what no white person has ever done is ask questions about whether or not if their hair is blonde or brunette, they're gonna lean further into their whiteness and would that be a problem? That is such a specific manifestation of what it means to speak the language of whiteness in our personal mm -hmm. lives. And then that manifests. So we police our lives according to how we've been taught whiteness will or will not accept ourselves. Yeah. So the policing of black women's hair mm -hmm. is massive. All of us have been through it, all yeah. different iterations of whether you had braids or twists or relaxed or weave or, or cornrows, cornrows or, or all of the different- All of us going natural, cutting or, off our permed ends. Ex and exactly. Fearing What's what that- What does that mean? mean? Will I get a job? Will I get yeah. the job? All of those different things, mm -hmm. because what it centers and comes back to the idea of whiteness is the aspiration and manifest that by being um, as little of yourself as is possible. And so part of our healing, what does it mean to have a return to yourself? And so the emotional economy in your own life manifests in all kinds of ways. We're sitting here in Ghana. The emotional economy of, of blackness means that instead of cabaret being the chocolate giant, or Belgium or Switzerland being the chocolate capitals. Ghana is, Cote d'Ivoire is. Why? Because we produce the cocoa. But the, our relationship to something that comes from outside of ourselves still tells us that that's better. And so this emotional economy that is an inheritance where we've been taught about who we are as black people and how we are shaped by whiteness and how the more we aspire to centering whiteness, the more successful we'll be. That teaching manifests in our economies on the continent. Mm -hmm. Our emotional economy is connected to our fiscal economy. Mm -hmm. And part of what emotional justice is saying is that we cannot underestimate the power of the connection and the emotional labor we all put into in either fighting against whiteness or negotiating with it 
in order to get to what we think is success. There's no magical pill. You've got to take the steps and do what I call, we've all got our emotional work to do. The question is, what is yours? What is your work, Nana, as a black woman versus the work of a white woman versus the work of a white man versus the work of a black man? And people tend to confuse whiteness, capital W whiteness, mm -hmm. with white people. Yes, I'm and, right about that. You know, and, and that, that always... That's always sort of, to me, it's where the buck stops, where it's like, whoa, 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 but like as a white woman or a white man, I don't feel that way. And it's mm. like, okay, so we can get into centering your feelings over facts, but also help people further understand when we say whiteness, right. what do we mean by that? Yeah. So the whiteness is a system. You're right. It is an absolute system that literally says the history of the world is that whiteness built it. Yeah. That is a system that everybody has been taught, black, brown, Indian, colored, indigenous, white, everybody has been taught that. And that leads you to believe that, which is what is designed to do that. Oh, so whiteness is the leader. That's true. Whether you are white, black, brown, or indigenous, then that teaching shapes how you see yourself. Yeah. Because if whiteness is the leader, what is the closest thing to whiteness? Then it becomes about white people, indigenous people, brown people, black people. The furthest away you are from the whiteness, the furthest you are away from wealth, from success, from what makes you um, powerful or important or loved or valued um, or treated well. And so I would say that, you know, whiteness is um, not like French. You might learn French and then you may choose to speak it or not. That's a choice. Whiteness is taught to everybody because we live in a world that has been shaped by whiteness. And being shaped by whiteness means that instead of knowing that Africa is the cradle of civilization, that it has all these phenomenal, sophisticated ways of doing and being, what we know is that Africa is a place of poverty that is poverty stricken, that it's on its knees, that is wretched and is constantly reaching out to and needs the help of the West. That teaching is the direct result of a world shaped by whiteness. And then that teaching shapes how Africans see themselves as Africans, yeah. how black people across the diaspora see Africa, and then how white people see black people and Africans. So the point about emotional justice is all of it is about complexity. There are no binaries. And whatever your politics may be, that may not have anything to do with your emotional relationship to power. And emotional justice is all about how does power show up in your world? How do you wield your personal power, your circle of influence? And how do you engage with other people's power in order to move through the world? So we want binaries because that's what whiteness has taught us. It's either white or black. Right. It's either good or bad. It either works or it doesn't. But that's not how emotional justice manifests. It's actually about the complexity of people's relationship to sustaining systems that are harmful. Even though they intellectually know they're harmful, they politically know they're harmful, they ideologically understand that. They still have an emotional relationship to power that centers whiteness even if their politics are as blackity black black as they want to be. Right. So you've got to wrestle with that and unlearn the whiteness in order to then do your emotional work and practice a racial healing. Yeah, and because in, a, in the context of both of us like having returned to Ghana, living in Ghana, mm -hmm. um, I can see where someone or even me as you're talking, I'm like, okay, well, that makes perfect sense because I grew up in America. Or if you grew up as an immigrant in the UK and grew up in like a clearly racialized society. Right. But in a majority black nation, um, someone said, well, we don't have that problem here. We don't have that problem in Ghana where our engagement with one another centers whiteness in any kind of way. Or yes, we, we consider do. White. And you say, right. So, then yes, we do. Explain to me how, yeah. how so in our society, in a place where there are it's a black president, it's a right. black doctor, right. it's a black power structure. Right, right. So the, how does it show up? When you go to Kempinski Hotel and you order a, a glass of mango, mango juice, it is not mangoes that were grown outside in, in Accra or right. brought from the north or brought from anywhere. Those mangoes probably came from South Africa. Right. That is the manifestation 
of emotional justice being needed on the continent. Mm -hmm. That is the manifestation of the emotional economy centering whiteness here in Ghana. If I go to um, Kabinsky and I want hot chocolate, I get Milo. I don't get chocolate that was from the cocoa farms here in Ghana that was mm -hmm. then curated and value added and created something so that the cocoa farmers have an entire industry that doesn't keep them in poverty. Yeah. But actually we have cocoa farmer millionaires in this country and that being a cocoa farmer is an aspiration because it is rooted to the land as wealth. In Ghana, our relationship to the land is that it's about poverty. So that if you go to the village in Ghana, that is the idea of that is that's poverty, that's bush, that's yeah, a place yeah. to leave from. If you go to the village in the UK, that's where the aristocracy lives. Move. And yet it's actually the same thing. The notion of the village has been shaped by the language of whiteness as a yep. place where you don't want to be, you don't want to stay, and then you want to leave. It's and where we're building our homes with alico board and steel when really we should be using latrite and, and exactly. natural, you know, things that allow for you to experience the natural elements like wind and sunshine exactly. and air. Exactly. It's like why and when you go to Parliament House, is there red carpet on the floor in, a, yeah. in an equatorial climate where we should be using the craftsmanship and the skill set of Ghanaians to build our offices, yeah. as opposed to importing everything from China and China leading the way. Yeah. All of those things are manifestations of how we speak the language of whiteness. And because we have been taught that if white people are not there, yeah. we're not speaking the language of whiteness, it is a miss understanding of what that is. Mm -hmm. Because when Africa stops speaking the language of whiteness, you can go from Ghana to South Africa and not need a visa. Mm -hmm. You can move around the continent with ease and do business. Mm -hmm. You can um, abandon the dollar and the UK and the UK sterling and the euro and barter in whatever you need in order to get to, from one place to another we would have exchange a, we would have a multi-billion dollar textile industry mm -hmm. as opposed to being a massive landscape of extraction mm -hmm. and a waste ground for dumping for used clothes that come from the west in all of those examples is the manifestation of the emotional economy of the continent mm -hmm. that still centers whiteness even our trade deals are designed to make sure that the West can continue to treat Africa as a landscape of extraction. Mm -hmm. Africa needs emotional justice. Yeah. Ghana needs emotional justice. We need a national healing. We need a continent-wide healing. And actually, in our work, Emotional Justice, in September on the 23rd, we're doing this event called Healing Harm, Healing History. Yeah. And our aim is to transform September into a month where we think specifically about healing within a black on black context. Yeah. What does it mean for us to engage each other here on the continent and across the diaspora in a way that transforms our economy so that they better serve us in the future that we want to um, build? And doing that event in the same way people think of Ghana's November and December culture, music, mm -hmm. partying, our work is to transform September and make it a month that is specifically about us doing our emotional work and transforming these things. And the healing. And it, when you were talking, it kind of remind when, you, when I asked you the question, it was like how the language of whiteness shows up in a predominantly black space like this. It kind of reminded me, you know, I have quite a bit of security coming into my home. Right. And um, I had a friend, I mean, she's, our father's Middle Eastern, but she, she's very white past and presents as white. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised when she texted me that, oh, I'm, your, I'm on your elevator. Because nobody from the front desk stopped her. had called me. And that means nobody from the front desk stopped her. She mm. just walked onto the elevator and mm. said, should I go back? Because I think I need to be swiped up. She asked me, do I need to be swiped up? Which had never happened with any of my Ghanaian or just black visitors ever. Right. right. That's, no, how, that's how we speak the language of whiteness. We look at a white person and automatically trust, security, safety, and most importantly, authority. It's like with, nobody asked her, what are you doing here? Right. Who just are you going to see? Who are you going to see? The what do you mean you're walking through the building and as security? Walk, as security, walk through the building. Right. And the assumption that belong in. That you belong. That you belong. And that also, even in a place like, like even yeah. here. And, and that even here, we should never use that language because this is how we speak the language yeah. of whiteness. The idea is that you 
are not only welcome here, that you have the right, right to be here, but also that I don't have the right to challenge your authority, challenge your authority in any position, way. In and any yet, way. what whiteness does is challenge blackness in every way, shape or form every single day of its life. Yeah. Whether that's racially through what happens in places like America or in the UK, across Europe, but also here culturally and then fiscally and then environmentally. And so the emotional economy of blackness needs a healing. We need to unlearn whiteness that makes this reality the kind of daily um, um, set of circumstances that we have to grapple with on a regular basis. And so we know living in the beauty of living in Ghana is to be surrounded by a blackness where you breathe a racial violence free air. Yeah. And breathing that if you've been in the West is massively important mm -hmm. because you know what it is to be policed in your blackness in a particular way. This is not that. So I want to be clear that there is a difference. And part of what emotional justice does, and I do it in the chapter called Revolutionary Black Grace, yeah. is identify the specificity of blackness, the uniqueness of blackness, and how that matters to all of us. Your blackness in America is not the same as your blackness in the UK, is different than your blackness in, the, in Ghana. But all of it matters and all of it is still connected to how we speak the language of whiteness and that manifests in our worlds. With emotional justice, we're saying the, um, the emotional and the individual connects to the institutional. Mm -hmm. It's about systemic change. And I treat the emotional as structural so that we understand e these are systems that we're trying to yeah. change. And if you do what I call the self-care industrial complex where you do individual work but it doesn't connect to any institution that is not emotional justice we ain't playing that yeah i'm playing like that we are not playing like because that. so so that we don't, don't i don't it. want because obviously i don't want to center too much on um i want to be able to move into the discussion about the main tenets of emotional justice you outline four specific sort of um frameworks within the framework mm -hmm. Um, can we talk a little bit about the first one is, I believe, is it emotional intimacy breaking that down specifically in how white men and how white women confront white men um, to break down patriarchy, emotional patriarchy, to break down emotional patriarchy? Yes. So there are four emotional justice love languages. That's what we call them. And the first one, intimate reckoning. Right. It's specifically about the work that white men and white women need to do with each other. Um, and their relationship to power that centers whiteness. Yeah. They've got to unlearn that because that relationship sustains harmful systems that don't do anybody any good except white men. That's intimate reckoning. Mm -hmm. Second one is intimate revolution. That's specifically for black people. Yeah. That's for black women and our relationship to labor that centers value. So in other words, the only way we measure our value is in how much we produce in our productivity. The more work we do, the more we can push, burn out, work it out, get it done, more done, faster done, better done, bigger done. The more we can do, the more valuable we are. But it creates a relationship to labor that is deeply self-destructive because it means that we think burnout is a celebration of our ability to work hard as opposed to burnout is burnout. You need to chill. We are doing the hashtag most and we absolutely need to chill. <laughs> but we all navigate and wrestle with a relationship to labor that centers worth and wealth, but also that emotional labor is the expectation of all black women and that your value is measured by how much emotional labor you can do in service of everybody except yourself. And so in black silence women are, too. Yeah, in si not just in silence, but in contentment. Which is not enough that you're silent about it, you've got to be happy about it. Yeah, be happy about it. And if you're not happy about it, that's a problem. I just had a very interesting discussion with a, a few of my girlfriends who are one of our friends with Divulgent that her boss slash mentor was saying, you know, modern women are in crisis because they can't seem to just accept the sacrifice of motherhood, that women of his generation, you know, his mother's generation and his of his generation um, didn't complain as much as they understood the sacrifice mm. of motherhood and where it came from, and that we're only complaining because we choose not to accept 
um, the sacrifice. And sort of our main pushback was, well, it's not so much that we don't understand the sacrifice that it comes with being a parent. We are saying that we no longer choose to be sort of silent or content right. with the heavy emotional laboring that it comes with. We're just saying we would like to do that in partnership, right. or perhaps we would like to just say it. Right. <laughs> Sometimes it was just being able to vocalize it right. um, and not be punished for saying, no, this is hard work. Right. Everybody knows that being a parent is difficult work, but right. why must it be that I have to be, not like you said, not just silent, but okay right. with right. the it idea... takes on my emotional right. life? And I think it's two things. I think one is that remembering that our um, mothers and our fathers raised us to be different women than they were. Yeah. Our mothers raised us to be different women than they were. Absolutely. They didn't necessarily know what the outcome of that difference might be, but we were raised to be different than they were. So I think part of it is there is a generational inheritance of rejecting what has been defined as this noble sacrifice. Yeah. That's one part of it. I think the second part of it is the idea that your people are simply saying, I'm not happy to be the emotional mammy. So in other words, I'm not happy to send to everybody's feelings, but my own. And, um, then be problematized because I say that this is a challenge and a problem for me. The idea that black women are the first responders to everybody and everything except for themselves is simply something that black women are rejecting. And they must because that's how, that's a game changer for the world. When that articulation begins, followed by sustained action, it will transform worlds. So much of the world relies on the um, emotional labor of black women, the willingness of black women to stay the emotional mammy and to cater to and be first responders to everybody outside of themselves. That's why intimate revolution is about ch transforming the relationship to labor that black women have and centering replenishment and rest in ways that, that we never have. Because the thing that will never be true is that black women will never just look out for themselves. Yeah. We're literally not wired to do that. Mm -hmm. But there's a difference between a really healthy, beautiful engagement with community and the levels and the kind of engagement that is literally abusive, problematic, is killing people, people are dying, and the manifestation of the abuse comes with all the different illnesses and challenges that black women are facing. They're dying, literally dying, not necessarily physically, but they're walking through the world in these living deaths that can be transformed, but only when we do our emotional work. And because the world is served, by black women being emotional mammies. Nobody is ever gonna tell us not to do that except us. And everyone's gonna push back when we do it because the loss of that labor, think about it, free, uncompensated um, unappreciated. labor, unappreciated, disrespected, but required labor in perpetuity. No one is gonna be mad at the loss of that, um, but, everybody will be gain, everybody will gain by losing that because it requires everybody to be more humanity centered and less exploitative about how, the, how we navigate and engage. So intimate reckoning is about white women and white men, intimate revolution, yeah. black women's relationship to labor, and it's black men's relationship to power and masculinity that means their sense of themselves as men is connected to how the white world sees them, respects them and honors them. That is a relationship that is never going to end up with safe, productive black communities or black nations. There is no black male leadership that can negotiate with whiteness and do well for its community, for its constituency, and for its citizens. It's not possible. We literally see it. You have half a Francophone Africa that takes its leadership cues from France. Mm. That is not doing anything for the Francophone African people. Mm. It cannot because it's designed not to. Mm. And that is part of how the emotional economy of the continent continues to work, that you have these leadership spaces that are designed to center whiteness and you have too many men negotiating their sense of masculinity with whiteness. So many African men that I came across loved Trump.
Yeah. They oh, love yeah. a relationship oh, yeah. to power, unaccountable, unfettered. Mm -hmm. I can say what I want, I can do what I want, I can grab this, grab that. Mm -hmm. Who is going to stop me? Who is going to challenge me? Who is going to change Who gonna you? Who's going to check me? Yeah, who's going to check you? That type of um, power has got nothing to do with community health. Mm -hmm. And it is the worst indulgence of abuse of power. And African people, black people should re re reject that every single day. Yeah. But that's particular work and black men, part of their emotional work is developing their own black masculinity of safety, empathy and accountability yeah. to themselves, to each other and to their community and their families. You cannot be human and healthy and not be accountable to somebody that you love. It's not possible. The other two love languages are resistance negotiation yeah. and revolutionary black grace. Resistance negotiation again is for white people who have to work through their own panorama of feelings about being challenged in how they contribute to sustaining harmful, oppressive systems. That it's their work to do to navigate feeling maligned, feeling accused, all of these feelings they have about being challenged because what they've been allowed to do is implode and sabotage real change because they get tended to. That is part of unlearning the language of whiteness. We call emotional patriarchy, centering the feelings of white people, even when that they are imploding and sabotaging the progress that would benefit all of us, including particularly white women, but not white men. And then the last one is revolutionary black race. Yeah. That is all about the work we have to do as black people with ourselves and each other to transform our relationship to ourselves and each other so that we put ourselves first and literally transform the communities, the continents, the context in which we live and thrive. And that really is what the four emotional justice love languages are. They are connected to unlearning the four elements of the language of right. whiteness. And You've got to, you're unlearning emotional patriarchy. You're unlearning racialized emotionality. You're unlearning emotional economy and you're unlearning emotional currency. We talked about emotional patriarchy being this world where you center the feelings of white people, centrally white men, all men, no matter the cost or consequence to everyone else. We have entire policies right now that are about the feelings of white men. Yeah. What does that look like? Roe v. Wade has been overturned in the US. When white men feel that they lose power, they manifest feeling more powerful by having ownership or power over somebody's body that is not them. Any woman, white women, and all black and brown people. That's how they navigate feeling powerless, is having power over somebody. It is deadly, deadly. And there is no resolution to it than to unlearn it. Um, uh, Racialized emotionality is the dehumanization of black people, yeah. very simply. Instead of universal human emotions, vulnerability, pain, anger, hurt, where vulnerability is met with empathy. If you're feeling vulnerable, how can I help you? How can I support you? But we know when you see vulnerability, vulnerability in the body of a black man, it's treated like a threat. They're treated like a threat. And instead of their em human emotion being met with empathy, their emotions are racialized, then they're dehumanized, and then they're targeted with violence. Same thing happens for black women. Anger is a universal human emotion. Anybody can feel for any circumstance. Instead of the res response being understanding, why are you angry, what has happened? There is a racializing of that anger. The anger is in your body as a black woman. So we racialize it first. Then- uh, Genderize it. Genderize it. We racialize it, we genderize it, we dehumanize the person. So it's no longer you are a person who is black, who is a woman who feels angry and we need to explore what that is about. No, now you're what? An angry black woman. You are treated with suspicion, somehow you're unprofessional, disdained. you're disdained and you're not trusted. You cannot be put in a position of authority. And what that means is black women spend an inordinate, inordinate amount of time 
doing what I call emotional rearranging and emotional shape-shifting. I can never be too angry. Let me police my tone. Let me watch my tone. Oh my God, did I say that in a way that that person's going to think that I'm angry? And what white people learn is to weaponize the word anger and target it at black women and black men when they're being challenged about a thing that would make any human being angry. And I see that we, we mimic Talk about take it on the language of, of whiteness. I've seen that amongst ourselves. Saying, mm -hmm. Oh, girl, you can't be losing. You can't you know, be too mad. Now. Be too mad. You need to be. And I, I mean, I had I had a, an incident in Ghana where I lost my temper and I felt so down about that. Mm -hmm. How could I let and it was it was it was Ghana police. Um, I was like, how could I let these people push me like that? Right. And I remember really getting practically no sympathy from every, anybody. Everybody essentially saying things like, even people as close to me as my own spouse saying, oh, does you know better? You know what these people want from me? They want you to get angry so that, the, you know, your vulnerability can be taken advantage of. Right. And I remember essentially everybody along the way that I would tell the story to would say something along the lines of, but don't you know better than to to talk back to Ghana police. And we need to really pause when we say that because yeah. it's so it's so painful, but it's so real. Yeah. Because the truth is, getting angry is human. You're right. It's a temporary feeling in response to an actual situation. It's human. When we remove anger from our set of emotions, that's literally the work of whiteness. We're literally saying we know we no longer have access to anger because of how much it's been policed and judged and demonized by whiteness. So now we're going to remove it from ourselves. But it's so natural to do that. Yeah. Who hasn't had an encounter with the Ghana police where you, where you haven't wanted mad. to scream? <laughs> scream at them. What the hell? And done it. Right. And also, it, it's, anger is cleansing. It's a way of releasing in order for you to move on and get on with your day. Mm -hmm. But what we have taught it, because there's so much policing of anger, people swallow it. They take it in, they take it down, they suppress it, they push it down. And it has health consequences. Mm -hmm. It is actually not human, not, not normal, but it's not human to suppress um, emotions. That's different than managing your emotions, which is adult and mature. But this is not about that. When it comes to anger and blackness, anger, blackness, gender, anger, blackness, masculinity is literally about the kind of suppression that is deeply unhealthy. It's dangerous because when you swallow it, it turns into something else and you keep swallowing it. So you are then engaging in your own, what I call emotional dehumanization. But it's celebrate. I mean, I feel like I grew up in a family that celebrated the ability to essentially shut down. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like... Um... Which is also another way, another one of the ways that we all speak the language of whiteness. The idea that we... Um, that emotion is like this. Right. We're just kind of stoic the whole time, which is very British, that very kind of stiff upper lip. Stiff upper lip. Stiff upper lip and carry on. Car you know. BS. Um, and that's actually not, also not human. It's just not human. Natural feelings, joy, anger, pain, vulnerability, um, safety, anger. These are all part of what it means to be human in the world. And there are things that will make you angry. There's a difference between wiling out acting literally crazy versus, and I don't even like that language, but there's a difference between that and something made you angry, you expressed your anger, and now you're going on about your day. Mm -hmm. um, that's, there's a difference between how we dehumanize human emotions versus the right to literally while out. And the people who do that are white men. White men are the people who literally while out, act crazy. You literally have the leader of the free world instigate an entire coup because yeah. I will not accept the fact that I lost power. Mm -hmm. I will raise this country to the ground and burn our political um, spaces of leadership to the ground rather than concede that I lost. And the that, fact, that is a problem with, with, um, with loss. That is a problem with dealing with anger because here, the manifestation of anger in white men is the absolute destruction of systems. You. But it's, it's literally received very differently. 100%. The tantrum, when these tantrums... And they're much more than tantrums because they end up... They're you know, much more than tantrums. Because exactly. white men wage war yeah. on the basis of their feelings. Yeah. 
They wage war. When white men want people to understand that they have power, they will go to war and use weapons and take out life. The love language of whiteness is violence. And so the idea that um, black people have anything to learn from that is simply preposterous. It's not just deadly and lethal and a lie, it is preposterous. And so that is part of unlearning this topsy-turvy world that whiteness has created when it comes to emotions. Because this notion that white people are stoic and that kind of keep calm and carry on is not true. When you look at colonialism, the colonization of Africans on their own land, if you look at Kenya, mm -hmm. the violence that the British perpetrated against the Mau Mau, why? They simply would not concede to the British taking the best of their land and them living virtually in reservations. That's the basic foundation of land, freedom, liberty which was the uprising that happened in, in Kenya. And when the oh, British- the Anglo Ashanti wars that waged exactly. off for hundred years. Exactly, and when the, when the um, British who always argue that this quote, there were atrocities on both sides. No, if somebody bursts into your home and tries to kill you and you defend yourself, that is not atrocities on both hands. That's an act of violation and an act of self-defense. One is legal and the other is not. When the British government finally made the settlement because there was a massive treasure trove that articulated the levels and the depth of the violence, the levels of the violence was extraordinary. But we have connected whiteness to calm and to reason and to rationale and to logic. And in denying our own spectrum of emotions, we continue to speak the language of whiteness deeply unhealthy. And we've also we need connected a black forgiveness or black magnanimity mm -hmm. with an alignment with that sort of whiteness is calm. Right. Whiteness is virtuous. Right. Um, because when you were talking, I don't think I fully understood the language of colonization being violent right. until I went to South Africa and mm. I started looking and I started witnessing and started fully really immersing myself in that story. Yeah. And that's when I began to really understand the violent nature of colonization and, mm. and, and what, it, what it introduces and what it steals right. from indigenous people who have to be a part of this. And I remember the first time I read, um, I write what I like by Stephen Biko, and he was talking about black consciousness um, and really immersing myself in the story. And I watched, I know that the South African Brasa Broadcasting Corporation mm -hmm. had completely covered the truth and reconciliation process. And I put the entire canon on YouTube one year. So literally every single episode covering pretty much every single week of the trial. Right. And it was interesting because I didn't, I hadn't known up until that point how controversial that whole process was and how there was so, there was so much. There was anxiety around it, but but there was a lot of opposition to it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know because growing up in America was see it was celebrated. Oh, right. and TRC happened and it was this beautiful sort of pathway towards peace with South Africa and everything was fine. And then I went to SA and I started doing my research and started digging and realizing one of essentially one of my um, philosophical heroes around black black consciousness, Steve Biko's family, had essentially boycotted the process and wanted real justice, wanted people to be arrested and put in jail, especially since the account of the officers was ruled to be essentially untrue. Mm -hmm. And it didn't really dawn on me until experience. And it's, it's like you say in your book, you quote Brian Stevenson and from one of his TED Talks, and he says, proximity. <laughs> Literally because of my lack of proximity, I had no idea. Mm. But obviously not everybody can travel to South Africa or Rwanda or wherever to look into some of these things and, and better ourselves and, and increase um, how we learn right. or what we learn. And so I love that in your book, you kind of break down the steps that we're supposed to take. And you talk about as we consider the love languages of emotional justice to break down the language of whiteness, you talk about feeling focused future mm -hmm. as sort of how the questions we ask ourselves. Right, right. <laughs> and, and so can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Emotional justice is inviting all of us to reckon with our worlds. Yeah. 
You don't have to travel around the world. You have to reckon with your world yeah. because our worlds are intersected and interconnected. So when I talk about feelings, focus and future, feelings is very simple. You're going to have to work through the absolute gamut of emotions that emerge when we start to explore how emotional violence functions to center whiteness and to um, require blackness to still be in servitude to whiteness. So um, in South Africa, for example, the outpouring of emotional labor that black people did in sharing these stories and telling these stories of what happened to them. And so many of the um, white officers, policemen lied. They just lied. They rewrote violence as leniency, as some kind of negotiation with blackness. There were multiple stories like that. The Biko family didn't just boycott the process, they sued the government. Yeah. Um, and it's important that that is said. Um, and so working through our feelings regarding the emotional violence and how it shapes us as a result of what we learn in reading the book is really important. But it's your circle of influence, family, community, um, sector, nation. So you start with exactly where you are. The focus is about asking different questions, which is how do I speak the language of um, whiteness? How does it show up in how I engage, with whom I engage, and how I show up in the worlds within which I work and live and play and do leisure? And then the focus is about saying, what if I centered somebody else? And how would centering somebody else transform my world? Now, if you're a black woman, the centering is of yourself because that is so rarely what is done. If you're a white woman, what does it mean to center the indigenous, to center the person of color, to center the black woman, to center the black man? With white men is what does it mean to literally center everybody other than us, other than white women? And so the point about those three steps is saying that if we all do our emotional work, which is why the breakdown of each demographic doing their emotional work is so specific and so intentional, it's saying that that's how transformation happens. Because when you come together, uh, if you're working with a white woman, she's doing her emotional work within emotional justice and you're doing yours. It's a different exchange when it comes to being challenged on issues about race or indeed specifically about power because power is always going to be where the buck stops the exchange is different when we're doing our emotional work the challenge that we've had is that we've created for example the world of dei diversity oh. equity and inclusion that is designed not for anybody not to do emotional work but for black people to continue to carry the emotional burden do additional emotional labor and for white people to remain entrenched in systems that center them and then weaponize their emotions whenever they're challenged in a way that would actually lead to real change. And so what, what we did with emotional justice is to institutionalize the entire framework, everything that you just spoke about, is to turn it into an institution called the AMA Institute of Emotional Justice and then make the unlearning and the reframing turn it into projects and training and thought leadership because we work with organizational cultures. The book is for the, is for the people. It's for people to literally do what you did, to read through it and think about how does this show up in my life? How does it show up in the lives of the people that I love? What are the conversations I will have with the people that I'm around because of this book? So the book is designed for people to do their work on an individual level. My organization is designed to make it an institutional, systemic and structural reality and then work with organizations to transform their organizational cultures. We cannot do the individual work and not connect it to the institutional transformation. We've tried that and we've done that and we know for a fact that it doesn't work. It's always been how whiteness functions. Tweak a bit here, tweak a bit there, but entrench and sustain the system of harm that serves whiteness and continues to dehumanize blackness. Can't do that anymore. Mm. Can't do that anymore. I want to, as we move towards sort of the end of our discussion, I really want to sort of center and focus in on revolutionary black grace. Mm. 
That to me, it's just, my favorite trip. I, yeah, you know, it really is. Even though I wrote the book, <laughs> you know, so it's that favorite. It's like having a favorite kid, right? I love to move into that place because yeah. when you were talking about even um, emotional language that essentially infantilizes whiteness, it's all they're just you know hooligans or whatever. So whatever, but oh, if it's a black woman that's showing anger, she shows no emotional control. And I was thinking about moments where I haven't given grace to my own people. Mm. Um, and because I believe in starting a home, even my own mother and how she may have handled certain situations emotionally. Right. And rather than sort of looking at that and say, well, what is she going through either personally or systemically mm -hmm. that puts her in this place? Mm. And I was it, it, reading the book and sitting here with you, being hit with that reality of what was she going through systemically that right. gave her that reaction? But also, what am I dealing with systemically, personally, otherwise, that holds me back mm. from giving her that grace or giving mm. myself that grace as well? Because I realize I don't give myself much grace. Right. I could honestly just cry listening to you talk <laughs> yeah. about this because I think it's really true. You know, one of the things we are nurtured to do and that is also enforced is to give the best of ourselves and all of our grace to whiteness, to outside of ourselves and not give ourselves or each other any grace. Mm -hmm. And we both enforce that and police that with each other. Yeah. Revolutionary Black Grace is saying that, what would it mean to give the best of ourselves to ourselves and each other? How would that change how we engage? Towards healing. Towards healing and that, a, a healing that is black on black, that is about black people with black people on the continent throughout the diaspora, is about saying, I have never given you grace. Oh I've never given myself grace. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've watched you navigate and move things. I may have, I know I've judged you. I know I might have policed you. I might have cajoled you into being better or to doing better. But what would it, what would it mean if I gave you grace? And then, then what would it mean if I gave myself grace? What would it mean if we gave grace to our mothers in the way that we're taught to give grace to our fathers? What would it mean if we understood that gr giving each other grace means developing a, fam a familiarity with a tenderness that we don't yet feel towards each other? That it's not or magic, or ourselves, that it's not magic that we've been trained to be harsh. Yeah. with each other and we know what to do with that and we've all learned so it's not a place of judgment with any of us as black people it's an understanding we've all been shaped to do, to do that we've all been taught to give whiteness grace and we know how to do that and we do it all the time mm -hmm. we have sometimes no idea how to give ourselves grace or how to reach out and say my sister mm -hmm. What would grace look like in this moment, in this situation that you're going through? And how could I show up and practice that? And the reason that I talk about it being a learning for us is that we are shaped by the, a whiteness that has taught us that we should treat violence like a love language. Yeah. And we should direct our grace towards them. Mm -hmm. And we have embodied that in many ways. Revolutionary Black Grace is saying we're going to internalize a grace and a care and a tenderness and a thoughtfulness and a kindness with ourselves and each other. And we're going to have to learn what that is because we don't always know. Mm -hmm. I don't mean that we don't know what kindness is. We do, but yeah. extending it to each other, giving each other um, a moment, a timeout, a grace is unfamiliar. And I define it as revolutionary black grace is a grace that is first of all specific to us as black people. It is one that honors the fact that we don't have regular trauma, that our trauma being rooted in, in being shaped by these systems, these harmful systems of oppression, of colonization, of apartheid, of enslavement, have shaped us and have shape shifted our emotional selves. Mm -hmm. So unlearning this is generations worth of work and giving ourselves grace means honoring that we are a people that came to any kind of liberation or freedom because of revolution. Mm -hmm. We know that that is literally our history. So a revolutionary black grace is honoring 
the history that moved us in any way towards any kind of freedom, but it's specific to us and that it invites a learning of being with each other in a way that feels unfamiliar, that we will have to practice in order to begin to feel it as real. But we must do that. That is our emotional work to do and nobody else can do it. Wow. <laughs> wow, thank you so much, Esther, because I really needed, I really needed that. Because just in reading the book and talking, I, I don't think I ever thought about it systemically. Mm. Right? And we don't. We don't think of it, we think of it, okay, personally. Um, but I've never thought of it systemically. Mm -hmm. But about extent, it kind of reminds me of Nikki Giovanni, I think was having, it's a recorded conversation. With, with James Baldwin. Yeah. With James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. But she says, you go out there every single day smiling to every stranger on the street, including your boss. You give them your best and you come home and you give me your worst. Lie to me too. You lie to the world about your internal state. Lie to me too. Mm. And I think about pairing that with revolutionary black grace. I was just having a conversation this morning with my cousin. And I said that my hope and my prayer is that my children get my best. If I can go out there and pretend to be happy and smile in the face of strangers, the least I can do is smile at my child when I see his face mm. or her face. Mm. And emotional justice will say, okay, so what does it mean to smile at yourself first? Smile at myself nicely. Yeah, what does it mean when you look in the mirror? Because so often we really, we don't see our whole selves when we look in the mirror, it's fragments. Yeah. And those fragments are stories. Yeah. And they're stories of what we're going through, they're stories of what we're working with, they're stories of what we're dealing with. And so, um, because before there were your children, there were you. There is you. There is you and there is your husband who came and made these beautiful babies. And there is, you are born, you are the daughter of somebody. Yeah. What would it mean to sit with your mother and say, Ma, I wonder what, what, what does grace look like for you? And part of asking the question is making room for the silence of the hurt of never having been given grace and that we won't always have language straight away, that this really is long game work. It is really generations deep. And so it's, it's an evolution from the Nikki Giovanni, James Baldwin, because we're not saying lie to me. Mm -hmm. What we're saying is let's do the work and do some healing. Let's find what it means to give each other grace in the face of a world that takes so much pleasure when we give each other pain. Amazing. That's the difference. I'm gonna leave it right there. Let's end on a note of a revolutionary black grave. <laughs>